Hi, uh, today we're going to be continuing our discussion of support vector machines, and we're going to talk about how the objective function changes if you relax the assumption that your data are actually separable. That is, you can find a hyperplane that divides the positive classes from the negative classes perfectly. So let's think about a data set where our assumptions might not perfectly hold. And so, can support vector machines work here? And recall that in the support vector machine formulation, we want the following to be true for every data point. That you want the dot product of the weight vector times the representation of a data point when added into the bias to match the sign of the true label. But if your data set looks like this, and you have a reasonable hyperplane that cuts through the middle and divides fairly reasonably the positive and the negative classes, what about points like this guy and this guy? Uh, they will violate the assumption of a support vector machine. So what we can do is we can add in slack variables. And so when we have bad apples, we can add in an additional term saying, it's okay if you get this point wrong, this point wrong, and this point wrong. We're going to keep track of how much we get those points wrong with an additional variable that we'll add in over here that basically keeps track of, of how many data points lie on the wrong side of the hyperplane. And so recall that the hyperplane dividing the classes is where you have wx plus z... <laughs> 3, 2, 1. Recall that the hyperplane is where you have wx plus b is equal to 0. So this is the case where the support vector machine gives you no answer. This is the neutral zone. And then you have wx plus b equals 1, and these are your support vectors for the positive class, and then you have wx plus b equals negative 1, these are the support vectors for the negative class. And the bad apples lie on the wrong side. So what does the objective function look like now? The objective function looks a lot like it was before in the normal case, but we add on this additional term that keeps track of how wrong our bad apples were. And so the larger these variables key are, uh, the more we're going to pay. And so this counts against how well we are doing in terms of having a wide margin. And so how much it costs is linearly dependent on this constant c, which controls the trade-off between the normal objective over here and our bad apples. But we're going to keep the constraint that we get everything right for normal cases, and we're just going to add in this additional term that says we can get some things wrong, and we'll also assume that these slack variables, as we'll call them, are all greater than or equal to zero. So just to recap, this is our standard margin. The key variable keeps track of how wrong a point is. The C variable trades off between the standard margin objective and how much we get wrong on the slack variables. These functions are often called loss functions because it tells you how bad a mistake is. When we move into deep learning, we'll see many more of these loss functions, and they'll increase their importance. This is our first foray into choosing a different loss function for our problems. For logistic regression, we just assumed that we were using logistic loss. So let's talk a little bit more about these loss functions. One reasonable loss function that you could imagine is a loss function that basically counts the number of mistakes you make. This is a 0-1 loss function. The kind of loss function that we'll dwell on has a couple nice mathematical properties in that it's mostly differentiable. 
and this is called a linear hinge function, or sometimes just called a hinge loss function. And so this is zero if you're getting everything right, but if you get things wrong, it scales linearly with that. And if you want bigger errors to count against you more, you can do something like a quadratic hinge where the loss scales quadratically the bigger it gets. But uh, we're going to focus on linear hinge today. It's a little mathematically uh, simpler and in practice works relatively well. But things are a little bit different now. We now have these constraints. We want our key variables to be greater than or equal to zero, and this means that we can't just do straight uh, stochastic gradient descent. We now need to use mathematical techniques from constrained optimization. And you may be familiar with Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange multipliers are a way that we can optimize a constrained function. If you have your original objective f, and you have constraints g, you can form a new optimization problem by introducing additional variables lambda that enforce the constraints g. And you put the original objective function with the constrained function g by taking the partial derivative of both f and g and creating a system of equations for each of the variables you're going to optimize. Let's see an example of this. Let's say that you want to optimize the square root of x times y, subject to the constraint that 20x plus 10y is equal to 200. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to compute partial derivatives of this. So first, we take the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and this gives us 1 half square root of y over x. Now we'll take the partial derivative of the constraint g with respect to x, the same variable, and that gives us 20. And now we'll take the partial derivative of f with respect to y, that gives us the square root of x over y times 1 half, and then the partial derivative of the constraint function g with respect to y gives us 10. And so now we have a system of equations where we're going to take 1 half the square root of y over x equal to 20 lambda, and then 1 half square root of x over y equal to 10 lambda, and we then have the constraint function by itself, 20x plus 10y equals 200. So uh, we can now do standard algebra to solve this. We divide the first equation by the second, which gives us y over x equals 2, and then this means that y equals 2x, so we can plug that into the constraint equation to give us that 20x plus uh, 20x equals 200, uh, which means that x equals 5, and double x to get y, that gives us 10. So this is the solution to optimizing the square root of x times y, subject to the constraint that 20x plus 10y is equal to 200. So what does this mean for support vector machines? We have our objective function, but we're going to add in additional constraints. The first constraint that we're going to add in is a constraint that we want our classifications to be correct, except when we have slack variables. And we're also going to add in the constraint that the slack variables have to be non-negative. So here are our constraints, and our Lagrange parameters are these new parameters alpha and beta. If we take the derivative with respect to w, then we can figure out that alpha i times y i is going to be equal to zero. The alpha i's are the Lagrange parameters associated with each data point, saying that we are getting this classification correct. And so, once we multiply all those alpha i's times y i's, that has to be zero. If we take the derivative with respect to b, the bias term, this tells us that alpha i, y i, x i, summed over all of our data points, gives us our weight vector. And this kind of makes sense. And then alpha i plus beta i needs to equal c. Recall that c is our constraint over how much we weight the original objective versus the slack objective. So with these 
tidbits in hand, we can now simplify our objective function. So w, we can write in terms of these alpha i, y i, x i. So every time we see w, let's replace that. And so now w is out of the objective function. Now that we know that alpha i plus beta i has to be equal to c, we can now get rid of the betas in terms of alpha. And so now the final term just becomes another alpha term. We can also use alpha i y i summed over all the data equal to zero to get rid of the penultimate term because this is just b times zero. Now that we've done the simplification, the first two terms can simplify further. And so now we just have minus one half sum over all of the data twice alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, the dot product of the features x i, x j. And this ends up being nearly identical to the separable case, except that we now add the constraint that the alpha i's must be less than or equal to c. There are very efficient algorithms for solving this objective function. We won't talk about it in class. You can do some online techniques. They become slightly more complicated because of the constraints, but they're not that bad. And the really neat thing is that adding these slack variables didn't break the SVM objective function. And because of this flexibility of the algorithm, uh, it's become a very popular algorithm for machine learning and data science. You can find implementations all over the place. Almost all of them are quite good. And using logistic regression and support vector machines are both very reasonable baselines when you are trying to very quickly get started on a machine learning problem. I strongly encourage you to try these algorithms first before moving on to more complicated algorithms like the deep learning algorithms that we'll be talking about very soon. Another reason that support vector machine algorithms are popular is because of the way that we've been able to reformulate the objective function in terms of a dot product between feature vectors, you can replace that dot product in interesting ways. And next we'll be talking about kernel functions that allow you to replace that dot product with engineered kernels that allow your algorithm to learn feature representations that are more useful than your initial feature representations.